Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining for another interview today. Uh, today, we are joined by a very special guest. His name is Aidan Dodson. Aidan is one of the most acclaimed Egyptologists. He is also, he also holds a BA in Eastern Mediterranean archaeology, as well as having written several books, not only on ancient Egypt, but also British royal burials and naval battles. Um, Aidan is the founding chairman of the Bristol Egyptological Society and has appeared in many of our favorite documentaries about ancient Egypt. So we all feel that we, we've, we've seen Aidan, we feel like we know him, but I would like to get to know Aidan a little better. So Aidan, thank you so much for joining. Very happy to come along. Thank you, thank you so much. Aidan, I'd like to start off with a question you've probably been asked a million times, but how did you become interested in history and was Egyptology always your passion? I think it probably was. Um, I, I became interested in the sub, in sort of history in general, I suppose, when I was about seven or eight which I think is a sort of age a lot of people get bitten by whatever are their sort of great passions um, in life. And about the same sort of time, I was taken to join the local public library by my parents and sort of started poking around sort of what, what they got. And um, even at seven, and at seven or eight, I was looking more at the his, history stuff. And then sort of came across these wonderful books full of skeletons, you know, morbid curiosity as a seven or eight year old. And this, these, of course, were books on archaeology. And then fairly rapidly, it became, I was more focused, I was more drawn towards the um, Egyptian, um, the Egyptian side of things. Um, rapidly read all the books on ancient Egypt in the children's part of the library. So then my parents ended up having to give up their um, reader's tickets for um, adult, the adult side of the library while I started borrowing books from that. Um, two, the two sort of books which really sort of kicked it all off for me were two. There's one called The Lost Pharaohs by Leonard Cottrell. And the other one is Temples, Tombs and Hieroglyphs by Barbara Mertz. And people may will be a, know Barbara Mertz also as the novelist Elizabeth Peters. And those two books together really kicked it all off. And that when in later life, I actually became a personal friend of, Liz, uh, for, of, Barbara, of Barbara's. Wow. And also helped her work with the second edition of Temples, Tombs and Hieroglyphs. Um, that was really quite something, having gone from the person who probably got me into the subject to actually being a personal friend of hers um, was really was really quite something. Yeah. And, and it then just that that was and that alongside naval history, which I also got into at the same kind of age, were my passions throughout sort of high school. How did naval history come about? I mean, that is so far detached yeah. from Egyptology. I I suppose part of it is because I come from a military family. Uh, my, my father, grandfather, and um, uncles were all in the army. Um, so there's probably an interest in military matters came from that. But for some reason, it was rather than just, it, it, it sort of moved towards the ships were the thing which, which I was interested in. So you know, those two are my hobbies as I sort of went through, say, sort of high school. When it came to deciding what to go to do at university, it was the question of doing something worthwhile, like you know, business studies or something like that, or do something I was interested in. So I then ended up doing uh, my BA um, in, as, we, as you mentioned, in Mediterranean archaeology with a very heavy Egyptian um, element to it. Mm -hmm. Then a master's in um, museum studies and um, Egyptian archaeology, then doing a full PhD in Egyptology. So it just sort of happened and it all came, probably ultimately came back to that sort of day I joined the, the local library at the age of seven or eight. <laughs> so it, everything started in the library. That's, uh, that's quite mm. a, a good lesson for, for kids these days, get back into the library. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Very much so. Yeah, and um, I think if, and say if most of the stuff I've done subsequently, I'm, I'm very much uh, as, as we'll probably explore later on, very much more a library-based kind of Egyptologist rather than sort of the hole digging uh, variety. And I've sort of all, I'm always at my happiest surrounded by books, and so that goes right the way back to to, to childhood. Yeah. How many hours do you think you spent a week in the library? I don't know really. Um, the lot, but a lot of it was a question of going, you know, for that, that sort of age of going to library, then borrowing the stuff. So you know, you borrow your books and then just then get then get completely, and then just when you weren't at school or whatever, just uh, bury yourself into them. And I don't think I'm ever without a book to hand, unless I'm doing something which doesn't require a book. Fair enough. But otherwise, if I'm just sort of sitting, you know, waiting for a bus, I'll have a book. It's so I think books have been. The key part of my existence or my, my entire life i think yeah yeah i i know for a fact we'll get to this later in the interview one of your books that really is like it's like my bible so <laughs> <laughs> um but before we get there i would like to know you're also very interested in um royal uh, british royal burials now how did that also come about? Well, part of it came from the, from it's you know, more of the general interest in archaeology to sort of to start off with. However, it also comes from the fact that there's a family link here, that my grandfather was the clerk of works at Windsor Castle, which is where many of the um, British royal tombs have been since, certainly since the, the, um, the 18th century anyway. And as a result, and one of his jobs was once a year to go down into the royal vault to put a, put some a flower on the coffin of the Duke of Kent, who'd been killed during the Second World War, um, and his widow, the Duchess of Kent, would send. Would, would, I'm not sure what day of the year it was, it was his birthday, or whatever. Would have um, a um, a flower taken down, and that was my grandfather, part of my grandfather's role. Now, unfortunately, he died when I was quite small, but the story they got passed on through my mother and also during most of my childhood we lived very close to Windsor and in fact my family ultimately comes from Windsor so my so my dad and I used to go to Windsor regularly for Sunday Sunday morning walks we'd go into St George's Chapel where the tombs are and so therefore I got to know that that environment and then the then the, the crucial bit as far as actually doing doing serious research on it though came many many years later uh, when both Salim and Ikram and I were at Cambridge together, and we had a day out to Windsor, and I was sort of the guy, and I was acting as, as her tour guide. We went to St George's <laughs> Chapel at Windsor Castle, and I was saying, "Well, here's the tomb of Edward the Seventh, whatever." And she asked me, "Well, what are the? How are these tombs? Are the bodies actually in these chest tombs? Are they in a vault?" And I said, "Okay, I'll." I'll find out, I'll try and find out for you. And over the next few years, I did research on that, produced a, a, an article on the topic, um, and then ended up producing a book on it. So it, it sort of came out of the fact that I've always been interested in what, what human beings do with dead bodies. It's always that's been part <laughs> of my, it's because in, in, within Egyptology, um, I've, my sort of, what I might call my core skills, if you like, are things to do with tomb design, coffin design, and all that kind of stuff. So actually having an interest in what the ancient Egyptians do with, 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 the, with, their, with, their, with, their, with their dead is also something which um, I want to, you know, applies for other things as well. So, it, so that's, that's really where it comes from. There's this general archaeological interest in these kinds of things, but also with the um, just with the whole question of um, you know like the archaeology of of, of 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 mortality, if you like. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things I'm currently trying to try to persuade um, at my department is we need to put a, a to create a teaching unit on the anthropology of death, which I think whole which is something I would be very happy to contribute to. That is something very interesting. That would be like what would you call it um like death studies or i don't know what would you yeah, call it? yeah. no it's, it's, i think it's, it's something because so particularly for the very wide our department is anthropology and archaeology mm -hmm. and as such 
that'd be a nice way of tying to pretty well all of us in the department, whether we're social anthropologists, Egyptologists, prehistoric archaeologists, although whatever whatever we are, um, what, what, whatever we are, um, will, would actually feed would actually feed quite neatly into that. Yeah. Have, have you ever noticed any links between ancient Egypt bear burials and British royal burials? Interest. There are certain sorts of little themes which keep on picking up throughout sort of the throughout the world almost. One of them is the desire to actually make coffins in the shape of human bodies. Now we're all familiar with Egyptian mummy cases, but actually when you look at into the history of um, British medieval burials, you have lead coffins made in the shape of the body. Which actually, if you just if you look at a sketch of one, you just think it's an, an Egyptian mummy case. Actually, then you realise it's actually the lead coffin with um, Henry the Seventh in it. So that that there's certainly that. There's always this there's always desire for commemoration, and it's interesting even when you're talking about faiths which don't believe in commemoration per se. You know, because in Islam, theoretically, you should simply be wrapped in a shroud and buried. No yeah. marker, no nothing. Yet, of course, people are building mosques and around those. Um, you know, in, in Christianity, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But you still you, you you mummify the body, you put it in elaborate tombs. So there's all. I think that human beings seem to have a certain sort of. Um, there's a thread. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so there's a little lot of things where suddenly these little these features pop up, pop up. But without any possibility of, of, of any any direct connection, you know, it's always our problem. Is that when when you have some of the more of the lunatic fringe, sort of saying, "Well, because there's something which looks Egyptian here, therefore the Egyptians must have been there." Well, come on, come off it. There's no way Henry the Seventh of England in the 15th century AD has anything to do with Egyptian mummy cases of a thousand years or more previously. Yeah, yet, like we even knew about it. Yet, 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 yeah, absolutely. Yet the morticians have come up with the same basic idea mm -hmm. but invented separately so it's a nice, I, I, I use that sometimes as sort of an example when somebody's saying oh well you've got this thing which looks like this in mexico therefore well hang on a second you know, let, let's go let's look at look at two look at a culture where we know exactly what the um, cultural affiliations are and when it comes to um you know we're looking at medieval english kings pretty clear there's no sort of um, Egyptian voyagers um, in influencing on that. Yes, yes. You know, I was actually, last year this time I was in Sicily and um, I was speaking to a lady, we were all having dinner together and uh, she was telling me about a, a city, a little village there. They, they had a, a ritual where once a year they would take the statue of the Virgin Mary and they would place her on a bark and two priests would carry her down to the mm -hmm. ocean and she would like calm the waves. And I said to her, oh, but you know, the Egyptians also used to like carry their statues and icons around on barks for special ceremonies. And she lost it with me. She was like, oh no, there's no connection, no connection. <laughs> so mm -hmm. there is exactly like you're saying, there's like almost like a human instinct where people are. I think so, yeah. There's so many things keep on getting reinvented and they seem to sort of suggest some kind of human human desire, if you like. Well, that's the way they you know where the way things go. Yeah, yeah. So that book you wrote about British royal burials, I hope that you dedicated it to Salima because it's uh, Oh I did, yes. It, it was it was the first edition was dedicated to Salima and the second edition was dedicated to her and also my late father but for his sort of because he was very much to blame for me actually getting that getting that um, interest. <laughs> great, great. Was there ever a time in Egyptology where you thought, hold on, I'm not gonna study this anymore? Where do you get your drive from? Well, I think part of it was because for 25 years, I, my Egyptology was actually part time. I had to take a day job, um, like so a lot of my, particularly with my sort of generation when I graduated, that wasn't good. So actually, for 25 years, I worked. I was a civil servant for for two, well, for for, for four days out of five, and one and only one day a week was I actually working actually as an Egyptologist. 
in a sense, somebody was actually paying me. So I was doing, I had a part, I was, I, I was a part-time, part-time teaching job um, at Bristol University, while I was also spending sort of four days a week um, as, a, as a government civil servant. However, it, I think it was because I wasn't able to dedicate my entire time to it, meant that I didn't get jaded in the sense that therefore it meant when I came home from, from the day job, I had no problem with immediately switching the computer on and working on my next ecological project. It, it's the, uh, it was just the logical me, withdrawal syndrome. Well, it's basically kept me sane, really, because after, you know, I don't know anybody here, anybody listening, has ever sort of um, worked in, you know, in, in government administration. Although it can be interesting at times, sometimes it can be absolutely uh, mind-numbingly stupid. So it was just nice to be able to, you know, to, to, to walk out the gate, go home and move into a world where I was actually in charge of it and was able to produce what I wanted to do rather than having to produce stupid reports for... It, that, that's, I, think, I think in many ways that was my most productive period if one looks at it purely time, you know, books, articles, whatever, produced for hours put in because there were, I, had, I was having to sort of use that time as well as possible and sort of focus myself on that. So, so I think I did, that, that probably helped me keep, my, keep the faith, if you like, with Egyptology. So I know there were certainly people I know in the broader world of academia who've just given up because they've, they've had it. There was actually one friend of mine at Cambridge, she spent four years on her PhD and she was about to submit and then she gave up and became a tax inspector. She just, she just suddenly it just it exploded and that was it. That was the end of it all. So in some ways, I probably benefited from the fact that I was forced to do a day job for a long time, yeah. um, which therefore meant that my sort of enthu the enthusiast in me um, sort of kept going because that was something which I could sort of ma maintain um, in parallel. And it's one thing I do actually say to students today, even if you can't get the academic job you want immediately, and you have to end up getting a day job, don't worry too much about it because it's possible you may well get back again. Mm -hmm. And also, depending on what your research areas are, you probably can carry on producing with very little difference from what you'd be doing if you're doing it full time, possibly slightly less amount of it doing, but you can carry on doing it. And I think that's a, an important thing, particularly nowadays where there's so many people are graduating in subjects when there's no way there's gonna be enough jobs for them. In yeah. some ways, actually, we're almost going back to the where it was in the 19th century, where a lot of people had a day job yet they made a major contribution. I think people like sort of Hinks and Goodwin and so on to British Egyptology in the 19th century, when there, was, there were no jobs to be had at all, not to be a few, there were none to be had, yet they were able to produce world-beating material. Yeah. yeah. I think it just goes, ultimately comes down to whether you can actually manage your time sufficiently so that you can actually carry on you know, that building, those building blocks. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you look at Howard Carter, I, I believe he didn't even finish high school. Um, so, and he was just good at what he did. Yeah, and I think that's, in fact, that's one of the things which I think in, in Britain anyway, that until the point came where there were so many PhDs being produced, you couldn't, you know, you wouldn't get a job without a PhD. You've got a situation where there are, we've had professors of Egyptology with no degree at all. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, Fairman, who's the professor at Liverpool, um, he didn't have, he had a certificate of some description, he had no, he had no formal degree. Yeah. Um, various other people um, got their positions without, without, without their doc, having finished their doctorates and so on. So I, certainly, I think certainly there's, a, there's a tradition, I think, in Britain of a much more sort of self-motivated thing. In complete contrast to the situation, say, in Germany, where law lays down that you can't have an academic job unless you've got X qualifications. Yeah. It's always been a little bit more, a bit more flexible um, in, the, in the UK. Yeah. That's the one thing that two of our mutual friends, Salima and John J. Johnson, have said to me many times is, have something secondary to do. Don't focus fully on the Egyptology. I think that's a very wise thing for many Egyptologists to, to do. Yeah, and I think from my point of view, when I actually got finally managed to get early retirement from the day job, 
what I did was I didn't fill up the space gained fully with Egyptology. It's when I actually managed to pick up my naval history again. Yeah. Because although I certainly had recognised there was no way I could do a day job and work on two academic disciplines to any decent level. And my name had been made in Egyptology. Therefore, that was what I did while I was having to sort of, sort of to have the day job. But then when I got rid of the day job, um, although I certainly increased the amount of my sort of Egyptology, um, but I also used that opportunity to then start getting into naval history seriously. Yeah. I'd been, I'd kept up, I'd kept up with the subject all the time when I was in all those years. However, now I'd finally got time to go into archives and actually do original work and start writing books on that as well as on Egyptology. Yeah, yeah. But Aidan, you have a huge array of books, Egyptological books that you have written from biographies, um, books about Nefertiti, Seti the, Seti the First, um, Ramses the Third, also great books for referencing and so on. Which is your favorite book that you've written? Ooh, now that's a, dif that's a difficult one to, uh, to answer. My favorite- like trying to ask a mother which is her favorite child. It is a bit of that because they've all they've all they've all have their own sort of bits of um, their attractions. I suppose in many ways the Mummy in Ancient Egypt, which I wrote with Salima, it was my first. It was first time I'd collaborated on a book, but also it was something whereby we were producing something which didn't exist before. So that's one of the things I try and do when I'm writing is not just simply write something which already exists. You know, there are plenty, you know, there's so many books on. And in fact, I always feel I have to apologise. When I my latest Nefertiti book, I had to always apologise in the preface that why am I writing yet another book on Nefertiti? But I, I mean, I'm in ancient Egypt, I think, was one which sort of was the first book where I've been able to fully sort of set out my stall on something. Um, I think it's still it's, it's still um, it's the only book which covers that full range of of mummies to coffins to sarcophagi and everything else. Well, we'd love to do a new edition of it at some stage. Uh, the, only, the only thing I the only, the only thing I don't is a pity about it is we weren't allowed to put footnotes in, um, which is one of the main criticisms of it in reviews. So when we did the tomb in ancient Egypt a few years later, we were allowed to do that. We'd like to go back and redo the mummy with all footnotes the trouble is the thing that things have moved on so massively since we wrote that in what, 1998 i think it was that the, the amount of work needed to get it back up fully up to speed with uh, as far as coffins all these coffin discoveries have been being made over the oh, last yeah. few years <laughs> all that's going to be taken into account so whether we'll ever get round to doing it is another question but uh, i think that's sort of probably my that was my first proud moment, shall we say. Yeah, yeah. What do you do to unwind from, from history? Um, I, I, can't, I read. Um, I, I'm a great fan of Terry Pratchett's um, novels. I'm just currently rereading the whole lot of those. Um, just watching a little, watching old bits and pieces on, on TV and stuff. Like walking. Um, so it's, that's, it's, I don't sort of, that's how, that's really, that's sort of how I, how I tend to sort of to do things anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, and also, and also in, 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 in other times, go traveling. You know, I like to get, we like to, we like to try and leave the country at least once every couple of months, if we possibly can. Um, and also um, at least, it, it, we normally do a trip in the autumn, which is to some we've not been to before. Then we all go to Egypt in January, and we're in the States or well, North America generally in April. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, so so we like to try and, and then you know just try and get away. Even and we like to try and say we're going to crop, we're going to leave the country at least once every every couple of months, even if it just means going across the border into Wales, which is only uh, a, a fifteen minutes by train away. Does does Diane is she into Egyptology or uh, what mm. does she think of it? Oh no, no, that's how we met. Um, she was doing an evening class in Egyptology um, and I was teaching the evening class. So yes, she very much, it was very much a case of, um, you know, that, 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 that she and the subject sort of came as a, as a, as a package deal. So no, that's great. It's, it's, that's one of the great things about having a, a, um, a spouse who 
is it, it likes the same things. So she's perfectly happy to be dragged off into the middle of the middle of nowhere to look at a pile of rubble. Um, <laughs> Uh, which I know, I know that there are other you know, other friends and colleagues who've got spouses who have got nothing, who have no interest whatsoever in it. So I think it make it helps that we're both in the same thing. And also, even she's she's in, she's quite happy to be dragged around old ships and things because her her late father was an engineer, so she was sort of brought up with old mechan with big with, with 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 big mechanical things. So um, no, I'm 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 very I'm very lucky to be married to somebody who. Uh, really appreciates the same sort of stuff I do. You are extremely lucky because when I go to a museum, I'm told, okay, you've got five hours, I'll just walk around. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm very lucky about that. And it was one, it was one occasion when we were, we, were, we, were, we were visiting the USS Hornet, um, museum aircraft carrier in California. And we were on, going on the engine room tour. And I think Diane was the only female on the, on the, on the engine room tour. And you could see the, the docent was just sort of was say, was thinking, oh, she's been dragged along. And then she started asking questions about the boilers. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, that's very, very lucky, and I hope that she passed her her evening class with very. Oh yes, oh so, yes, yeah, she she got she got a certificate in Egyptology out of that. So yes. Good, good. <laughs> so, this book of yours, Aidan, mm -hmm. "Complete Families of Ancient Egypt." This is a book that I look at probably once a week. Um, I use it for referencing when I write essays. It is literally like my Egyptological Bible. I use it so much. And this is also the first ever Egyptology book that I bought. Wow. Thank you for this amazing book. Mm. But I'd like to know, how did the book come about? And okay. how, how was the research going into this book, I mean, it's quite extensive. Yeah. Well, okay, the, the origins, uh, uh, but you know, as you, as you see, it's actually co-written with, with Diane, my wife, yes. and it was her idea fundamentally. Well she, she, well, she got the whole thing going. Basically, one day, while we were doing, while she was doing the, um, the, uh, the evening class, We've been. We would. I think one class. I've been talking about something to do with the royal, with royal family genealogy, and she actually is an amateur genealogist. She's done. She's traced her own family back centuries and so on, and so she was making a point while I was talking about this. She was drawing out fam the family tree because, and then later on in the way afterwards, she was saying, "I did this because this is how maybe I, I can understand what's going on, rather more than simply a narrative of the of, of the whole thing." So, um, and then she said, well, is, surely there is a book where, where all this stuff is. I said, well, no, there isn't actually. And, and we sort of said, well, let's write one then. So that was the origins. It was a little bit like Salima asked me the question about the British Royal Tombs, about the tombs in Windsor. This was again a question of Diamond said, well, so therefore we then went ahead and did it. She was very much the person looking at the how the genealogy should actually be drawn out. Because one of the things that always annoyed her about the um, about a lot of books which have got royal genealogies is they don't actually follow the pattern you're supposed to do them. Okay. You know, you have sort of you know, some a son dropping down half a page because he cut to fit him in. Now she was, so she was very much insisting that we did it properly with everybody in the same generation on the same line, mm -hmm. which is slightly problematic when you've got cross generational marriages under the Ptolemies, for example. So there were certainly bits where we had to sort of slightly sort of skew, skew that. But that was so that was where. Yeah. And as far as the actual writing was concerned, what I'd done. There's quite a few things I'd already done in the past regarding certain clumps of them, particularly the royal families of the 18th dynasty had been something that had always been a major research interest of mine. So a lot of that was already in existence almost. Um, then it was really a question of just slogging through the existing uh, reference sources. Um, there's still um, Gautier's Livre de Roi from the early 20th century, it's still got some, it's still useful as a catalogue of who was known then. There's a couple of other volumes, uh, for example, Lana Troy's Patterns of Queenship has got a very nice catalogue of all the queens and princesses in the back of it, which was useful. So there were a few um, existing sources I could sort of start off as building blocks. Yeah. 
and then from those building blocks then okay what isn't known then sort of disappear into, into the library for a few for a few weeks to sort of work through that and gradually the whole thing then built up um the frustrating thing slightly was that everyone was trying to finish the book off new discoveries were being made so therefore you know so you thought you'd finish, have to try and redraw that bit of the of the family tree, um, and, and and stuff like that. Um, and so eventually, and eventually got there. The first edition. What you've got there is a, is the is a sort of second edition, in the sense that it was going to into, it was going to go into paperback, um, yes, and we were told, you, yeah, and you, and you, you were told, well, you've got about a fortnight to do any corrections. And I also managed to actually make some proper change as well as simply corrections into that um, managed to fit in a few people who had missed out previously because i'd either missed them or they'd only just been discovered um well, that or, is also frustrating in egyptology is when you are not exactly sure is this the brother or is this the son or it becomes very confusing oh very definitely yes yeah and and in certain places in there i did have to make a had to type had to make a call you know, a judgment call as to whether who I thought, how I thought it, it best worked. Yeah. And so since that, so, and since that was done, things have moved on. Um, I would, if very much like the mummy book there, I, there's some major revisions of little bits of it, which I'd like to make. But again, whether we'll ever actually quite get round to that or not um, is, another, is, is another matter altogether. Yeah. Uh, the trouble is, I think with Egyptology is it's a moving target. Um, it's changing every day. Precisely. Well, one of the things we you know when I went through this, when I went through, there were two, there was, when I did the second edition of Amarna Sunset, for example, I had to change seventy-five percent of the of the pages in one way or another, and it, that was only when I was I was eight nine years on from the first edition. Um, the Afterglow of Empire again, I had to completely rewrite a whole one whole chapter with lots of other changes because sometimes it's just one discovery has this knock-on effect on everything else. Um, for example, on the Amana, on late Amana, discovery that Nefertiti was still alive and, and still acting as, a, as just an ordinary queen yes. six months before her husband dies was, some, was, a, was a complete revelation. And it suddenly ruled out a whole load of some of th certain theories. And then in the 25th dynasty, it's just been recognized that Shabaka and Shabataka have always been put the wrong way around in history. If you reverse them, there's a, the, the, the ripples which come off from that are quite massive. So the whole of the 25th dynasty has to be re rethought. Yeah. Um, so it's, so it's, it's even just one of these odd little discoveries. And then when more major things happen, it's all, you know, so it, it, it is very, it's, it's, a book is almost obsolete the day, you, the day it actually goes to press. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I am fiddling with new facts coming in as sort of look, we, we, we press the button on the printing press like next week, and you've got to get some of those things in. Yeah. So yeah. it's a, it, it's quite a an interesting um, aspect to it, and I think it's something which I don't think a, ev as many people understand as they ought to. Um, you know, there is this. There, there, you know, I, I've had before now with students say, well, why can't, why shouldn't I be using this book which was written in 1950? You know, he's a distinguished professor who wrote it. But well, yeah. Unfortunately, since he wrote that, lots of new data has come out. There's been new ways of looking at things have come out. Um, you know, it's on the other hand, though, you know, you've got to be careful that don't just simply jump on the very latest idea because that might actually be wrong. There's always this terrible temptation to simply assume that the, the latest, the latest book on something, the latest article is the way it is and everything else is wrong. In certain things, that's not the case. And in some cases, actually, somebody's the same scholar, their initial ideas were actually the better ones. They've actually then moved on to something else. They've changed and their mind. Actually, their first idea was the, probably the right one, whereas they changed, you know, the, the change of minds wasn't ideal. So it makes life very interesting. It's one of the problems why I, one of the things which I've been doing quite a lot of recently is historiography. How do you write history? And a book which I'm sort of hoping to write, get written eventually is a history of Egyptian history. How was it we actually got from the reconstructions which people like Champollion or Wilkinson came up with in the 1820s and 1830s through to where we are today? And how, what, you know, where are these tipping points where certain ways of looking at a particular period 
completely change. Yeah, yeah. Well, whenever I write Egyptology, I read several different sources if I'm writing about somebody and I read all the sources and then I put them all together and I make a story in my opinion of fitting together little things because it's great that you can read something here and there and go okay well that's how that ended up there yeah yeah I think I think I think, I think that's the important thing is actually to explain how you get somewhere yeah. that's the reason why although in my main text I'll probably just have put a nice narrow a reasonably nice narrative there may be some extremely long footnotes for me to explain actually other people think something a bit differently why they do that yeah. um and I think that's quite important to recognise that even if you think you're right, it's always important to, to actually tell people there are people who disagree. Yeah. There are some colleagues who won't do that. <laughs> you know, they, will, they, will, they will not put in the bibliography something which they don't agree with. Yeah. I put it in, but I may well put a footnote which explains that I do think this is actually complete junk. <laughs> However, you know, it's, 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 one needs to be aware that this person actually came up with this idea and sort of some idea of why you think that happens to be junk. Because otherwise, you're simply, you're, you know, otherwise you're, danger, you're, you're in danger of just simply censoring the research which has taken place. So I think that's, that's an important aspect to always be quite clear what has been said about something and clearly why you're saying your version of it rather than going with the with the with the other person's um, approach yeah but your academic uh publications are actually quite amazing a few of them that really stuck out to me were obviously for me around the 19th dynasty um particularly about the tomb of amun messi uh mm. what are your thoughts on the end of the 19th dynasty because for me I find it even more dramatic and more confusing than the end of the Amarna period. Yeah, well, that the the, the eight, late nineteenth century was something which I got into very very early on. I think one of my sort of second or third published article was was to do with Tomb of Amenmesi and it's sort of what it what it all meant. And in fact, it was something where I did sort of change my mind to some degree. But basically, the situation seems to well, in fact, the. Um, the reason why the book on my book on the late 19th is called Poisoned Legacy. In fact, the original, the full title was The Poisoned Legacy of Ramesses II. Because I think part, I think part of the problem with late 19th dynasty is that Ramesses II left so many offspring. Yes, and it was a fight. Yeah, so, so and I think, and, I, and also the other thing which he did, or at least probably Seti the first kicked off this whole thing, is actually he made the royal family a thing. If you look back into the 18th dynasty and earlier, it was basically the king, the queen, and possibly a couple of princesses. You didn't actually have in your face a royal family on the walls of temples anyway. Okay, you knew about princes and princesses from the tombs of their, of their um, nurses and things like that, but you didn't, they weren't on temple walls. They weren't public figures, yeah. Now, exactly. Then Akhenaten sort of starts moving in that direction by putting his daughters on the walls. But then the 19th dynasty, probably because it's now revised, they're, they're, they're a bunch, they're, they're, they're commoners who got lucky and got the throne because Horemheb didn't have any, any children. They I'm using the word commoners. <laughs> <laughs> they um so they, they so, so therefore, and for them, they want to emphasize the fact they are there is this royal family that they've been previously. It's been, almost been sort of you know you took it as red, and so they put it. So what you're ending up doing, I think, is that rather than a king's son who in earlier time would simply have gone off and got a job, you know, because he's not been pushed out there as this is Prince so and so, whereas you've got you know, fifty of these princes under Ramesses the second. So I think what it means is younger sons start getting ideas. And therefore, the way I what I the way I read what happens is that after Merimptar's death and Seti II comes to the throne, Seti II's son decides that he is more worthy of kingship than his father. So you then get the rebellion of Amenmesis against his own father, Seti II. There is a civil war which Seti II ultimately wins. But dies fairly soon afterwards, leaving the only the, leaving the only possible heir to the throne, the actual the the infant son of Amenmesis, who is Siptar, according to my my picture. Siptar is a child. Um, 
um, probably eight when he comes to the throne. So therefore, Seti II's widow, um, Tawasrit, is the it, it become becomes regent along with the Chancellor Bai, who I have my suspicions that Tawasrit and Bai might have been a couple, very much like Hatshepsut and Senenmut. Um, but then it all goes horribly wrong because then suddenly we find Bai being executed, going from being the regent of the country to suddenly being executed. And then a year later, Siptar's dead as well. And I have a horrible suspicion that Tawasret is a bit of a Lady Macbeth kind of figure and that it's not impossible that this, the death of her husband, her, 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 her step-grandson, as well as Bai, may all be at her hand. Now, this is something I've been trying to write a, a novel about for years. I actually ended up writing, I mean, my original thought was to write a novel and then end up writing up the, the, the proper sort of academic study of it. And of course, you can't, you know, in an academic study, you're not going to start sort of you know, making accusations of Tawastra as this. But I think that if I was ever to finish this novel, that's the picture. It's, it's she's also almost these of the Livia or Messalina or or, or so and then, and then it's but then I think she come that her final that she goes too far when she bumps off Siptar. Yeah. And that's where Setnachti, who is some kind of cousin, he must be from it must be one of the descendants of some one of the offspring of Ramesses II, he comes in, there's the final civil war, and he wins, mm -hmm. and then Ramesses III comes along. So that's what I think's going on. That it's actually there's this, there's a it's a it's a basic a family issue going on here with Amon Messes um, being somebody who is, you know, a younger son who decides he is the be he's going to be a better king. Um, well, again, the end sort of nice parallels of the English Wars of the Roses as well, all these kinds of things happening. But then there's Tawasret um, as sort of the, uh, um, as, a, as, a, as a figure with her, with her tentacles sort of uh, producing what goes on. So that's sort of my, my sort of rather over, my dramatized, over dramatized version. That's what I think is going on. Yeah. Well, I find it extremely interesting, the end of the, the 19th dynasty. Uh, it is certainly quite dramatic. Um, I, I, always, I always look at it and think this is something more happening than what we knew what was happening. I mean, even Tawazrit's tomb was used by Setnachti. Yes, but also you know, what's interesting about that tomb is the way that you can see the transition of her of her status, um, and in the first corridor, you've got a couple of reliefs which have started off as being Tawasret simply as a queen, as regent. Then those figures are reworked as her as king, as pharaoh, and then they're reworked again to turn them into a male pharaoh in the in the form of Setnachti. So it's a, it's, a, it's one of my favourite tombs in the Valley of the Kings. I can never get too much of it, and it's one of those. And if anybody, if I'm leading a tour group or something, and they sort of ask for tips on which tomb, I say, well, Tawastret is has to be there on the list because it's a beautiful tomb, but also the story behind it is fascinating. Yeah, well, I, I'm working on artistic, also reconstructions are based off the mummies of the 19th dynasty, um, because we literally have every single person in the line apart from Armand Messi. Um, so I'm working well, well, on- we, well, we think, well, we're not sure because that the yeah. mummy, that, 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 that woman's mummy, which some people have said is Tawasret, may not be. And also analysis of Seti II suggests he's actually of the wrong, he's, he's, he's not a member of the family at all, that he may actually be an 18th dynasty mummy. Yeah, so he had might, that resist, he had that overbite. Yeah, but also there's just, if you, if you, if you read what the, um, the sort of, the, uh, I think also the, the, the um, the various analyses of that mummy, it's, it just doesn't, it doesn't work very well. He appears to be too, too young. And so um, there's, 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 re there's reasons for to suspect that Seti II may have ended up being mislabeled in ancient times. Yeah. Well, when I do the reconstruction, I'll put a question mark next to his mummy. And I think so, yes, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll put a footnote, according to Aidan Dodson, <laughs> but there's, 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 a, there's a chunk of, of a poison legacy where I discussed the whole question about his mummy identification. So just can just refer to that. Yes. <laughs> but uh, another question about something that you've written was also about the renaissance of old kingdom art in the late um, 
in the late the later part of the new kingdom do you think that there were other factors that played into that apart from just the expulsion of the the assyrians yeah well, yeah, well, yeah. well in fact it's before the fact it's all kicks in actually but well before the assyrians the the the, the, the earliest examples of getting this kind of old kingdomy stuff seems to come about around the uh, sort of late 22nd dynasty around the reign of shoshank the fifth or slightly earlier i think what may lie behind that is that this is all this all happens when the civil wars which have racked Thebes for probably about 50 odd years have come to an end. For those who don't know that the third intermediate period is an utter nightmare um, to try and sort of explain in, in words of uncivil. But basically what happens is under Azorkon II. This book explains it in a pretty reasonable and uh, reasonably understandable way. Yeah. Uh, but 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 basically that basically under Azorkon II, the country splits. There's a king in the north at Tarnis, and then there's a king in the south at Thebes. Fine. What then happens, however, is the king in Thebes then has a rival in Thebes, and then you have a period of some decades where you've got two kings one, uh, claiming to be the king of Thebes. Um, it almost seems in almost like a musical chairs. It looks as though one, well, that one side wins and is in uh, possession of Thebes for a while than the other one does. But at the end of it all, Azorkon III wins. Yeah. And what and it's his son, take lot, well, in fact, in, actually him and his son, take lot the third, who seem to kick off this whole trying to turn the clock back in their in their in their royal titles particularly because during the third intermediate period royal names had become shall we say over rather overblown with huge numbers of epithets they both shrink it simply back down to a simple pre-nomen and a simple nomen of just their name very much on old kingdom style and the same thing seems to be then that idea spreads up to tarnis under the under shoshank the fifth um, who's rough, contemporary, contemporary with them. Yeah. And alongside that again, and I think possibly it starts off with the royal names, but then become moves on into the art as well. So that then Azorkon, the, the fourth of Tarnis, his reliefs, if you didn't have the cartouches against them, you would think they were third dynasty. They've, the artists have clearly been copying material from the as, uh, as far back as the third dynasty and i do wonder whether that is actually when um the substructure of the step pyramid the third dynasty step pyramid is penetrated and people draw copying grids on some of the underground steely there a couple of the there's the the step pyramid is un almost is unique amongst pyramids in actually having relief decoration which yeah. are figures of the king um in various ritual poses and we know that, and there's art, there are there's a, there's red there's a red grid has been put onto that subsequently, which has normally been attributed to the 26th dynasty. But I do wonder, given the similarity, the, the close similarities with Joseph's reliefs in these ones of Azorkon the Fourth, um, and there's it no other it, sort yeah. of stand, standing sources for these things. I do wonder whether it's actually as uh, under Azorkon the Fourth that, that penetration of the substructure of the step pyramid takes place, and that's when the, tech, the, de the copying. Interesting. Then we move on from that point as you move into the Saite period onwards. This old kingdom style becomes absolutely standard. Same goes for royal names. But they're slightly more interpreting um, Old Kingdom art rather than copying it so slavishly as they do. So with these, fairly recently discovered again, these these reliefs of Azorkon the Fourth were only found like 10, 15 years ago. So they've not really they've not been factored into the standard histories of Egyptian art. Yeah. Which again is what we've just been saying about the way that that, that Egypt is very much a move, Egyptology is a movable feast, and that no matter how standard your work on something is, whole new things sort of you know, just creep in. Exactly, exactly. Talking about new things, you have a newly published book with the one and only Salima Ikram, a history of world Egyptology. What inspired that project? 
Right. It's not actually quite out yet. It's it's been delayed. I think it might. It's, we were hoping it'd be out by Christmas. It may be the New Year. There's sort of a, the advert. We we it, it isn't out yet because we haven't had the final proofs of it yet. So, but it's it it, it should be it's it should be out within within a couple of months, whatever happens. It was basically, in fact, it was it's three of us who are the editors, myself, Salima and Andrew Bednarski, actually all of us um, Cambridge PhDs by, um, by, 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 I think, I'm not sure whether it was actually, there's actually a connection or not. But anyway, well, all three of us are eight bit, uh, Cambridge PhDs. And it all came about initially about oh, 10 odd years ago when Salima and Drew, and also Peter Lacavara, who used to be, who was originally going to be one of the editors, basically came, we're discussing with um, Cambridge University Press as to what might be a useful volume and they recognized there hadn't there was nothing really there were histories of Egyptology but nothing which looked at the history of Egyptology from individual nations points of view yeah. and so therefore the standard narrative was very very much sort of UK US France Germany centric Soon after that decision to do something, a proper international history came in. I was I was brought on board, and the whole thing developed into trying to get a scholar from each of the significant each country which had done a significant amount of Egyptology to produce the the history of their of Egyptology in their particular country. Okay. Um, with their and as a result, we've probably covered about 90%. There are a few bits which haven't been covered, but we have got basically um, all the, 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 you know, the, the obvious ones, Egypt, UK, USA, um, wow. Germany, France, and also Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia, all these, all these parts of the world. So that within that, one is actually being able to hear the, different, the, the voices of how Egyptology has worked in each of those, each of those countries. So it's, uh, it's, like this, it's gonna be about 600 pages. It's a fairly um, chunky thing. Yeah. Um, but a facet, but it's been actually one of my major roles in it was as the lead copy editor. And um, it was fascinating just to see how things looked, because I was probably the first person to read the whole lot, was just how, how events looked differently from different parts of the world. And yeah. where you know, what was really important for the development in one in one particular country and so on, yeah. um, how far they were sort of principally influenced by the French or by the by the Germans academically. Uh, so yes, yeah, there's some fascinating stuff in there uh, about about all these various th threads of um, how the, how the story worked internationally. Yeah, I believe um, John Roma had a very uh, interesting statement about how Egypt, Egyptology was perceived in different countries, um, you know, based on what people, what qualities people admire in other people in that country, how it affected how they wrote about the ancient Egyptians. So, for example, um, it's weird how certain pharaohs are more popular in certain countries than others. Yeah, I think there's also a degree as to how acad acad academized, I suppose you'd want to call it. Some countries, Egyptology has been very much a top-down thing, particularly in someone like Germany, where it's where the posts were created by the government and yeah, and everything sort of was, was was built around a broader sort of um, national sort of nationalistic theme, and in others where it's from bottom up. So you know, whereas in France you have a chair of Egyptology established in, nine, in the eighteen thirties, um, in parts of Italy you've got a similar kind of date. Germany eighteen fifties. We don't have a chair in the UK until eight, until the eighteen nineties, and that's purely by private as a base of a private benefaction. Yeah. At no point really has, has Egyptology ever been something regarded by the British um, establishment as a good thing quote unquote <laughs> um, it's all it's everything has always been done from the bottom up so hence know that the the principal excavation body in in Britain has always been the Exploration Society which is funded by by donations from individuals with a certain amount of money coming in sort of from, from museums. Whereas in Germany, you've actually got the you know, archeologist, the head of the archeology uh, archeologist in Cairo is actually, is actually a civil servant. 
or even a diplomat even. So there's yeah. some very interesting stuff about whether or not there is a state belief that Egypt College is a good thing for a country to be into versus ones where, actually, yeah. where actually the government couldn't give a damn um, and it's all down, it's all being pushed up from, from the bottom up. Um, that was one, that's certainly one, one thing which really does come out is how that, and occasionally you've got sort of a mixture of the two, but it tends to be those, those two models. There's either that it's a, a thing, you know, sort of st state academia, versus the sort of the, the say very much the, um, the 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 bottom up approach, which you get say certainly in the UK and also really to the, in, really in the states as well. Aidan, do you enjoy excavating as an archaeologist? I haven't excavated since I was a student. Um, I'm, and it, part of it was because I had to have a day job for most for a lot of for my career, so it wasn't really time to go off digging. But also, I'm very good at it. I spent a couple of summers as a student doing the what. Uh, as you pretty well have to if you're doing an archaeology degree uh, digging. I wasn't very good at it, whereas what I discovered what I was good at was digging in museum basements in archives. So therefore that's really where my excavations have always been, um, say working through, working through archives, um, looking at long neglected objects in museum basements. And I, I'm always fascinated when trying to, tra to track an item which is sitting in a, a local a local museum somewhere with a, apparently nothing other than it comes from Egypt, yeah. and then then picking one's way back through the archives of the institution to find out who it was who who donated the thing in the first place, and then gradually, then finally managing to work out who the person who donated it was, and in fact that almost leads into sort of, into sort of social history. Um, some years ago I was working on a couple of coffins which are currently in Plymouth Museum down on the, on the south coast in Britain and it turned out that they had actually one point been in a house in Bristol um, and then the person who, you know, who who'd had them there, how he'd acquired them. And we ended up at one point even doing a sort of mini excavation in a Quake graveyard to find, to actually re, re, rediscover the gravestone of the guy who had actually been the key person in this, in the history of these, these um, coffins in, oh, wow. in modern times. So, and, and we go, okay, there was in, in there ultimately about what his titles were, the owner of these coffins. But the whole thing ended up being the story of a little episode of Egyptology in the southwest of England. Yeah. yeah. And that's the sort of stuff I I like to do. It's you know, so some of it is I'm happy, you know, looking, I'm very happy to work, you know, working on what happened in the past, yeah. but actually trying to find out how that past was influenced by the present how how the ideas came to hence the reason why that might be interested in this whole question about the history of egyptian history why do we think about why, why do we think something about what, what's going on who had those ideas what caused them um, if they were caused by a particular object what's the history of that object in modern times how did it become visible to um to, to, to the wider to the wider audience, and in fact, these, this this series I'm book, books I'm currently doing, which includes Seti the first, Ramesses the third, Nefertiti, and the others which are coming on beyond that. There's a whole section in that about how these people actually were first revealed again to the world, because you know until the 1820s, nobody even knew Nefertiti even existed. Yeah. She'd been forgotten for thousands of years, and in fact, um, what was interesting with her is just finding out how she just starts to appear in histories simply her name appears then she sort of you know then she becomes sort of she's sort of focused as being sort of part of the the, uh, the 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 couple with Akhenaten and then when her head then when that is, and then when the the bust is is found in 1912 so oh, at, least, yeah. at least when the bust is revealed to the world in late 1923 she suddenly becomes a cosmic megastar yeah. so yeah. how you sort of it's, it's how somebody comes from from zero to sort of to heroin in that particular case is another little thing about we're both looking at how uh, we reconstruct Egyptian history, but also how the world looks at Egyptian history. But about Nefertiti, I remember a couple of years ago you appeared in a documentary with Josh Gates, mm -hmm. uh, which at the time was causing quite a bit of controversy um investigating the younger lady and if she was nefertiti now i have to say 
no one changes the world by not being controversial. So good for being controversial because how are new discoveries going to be made if you're not? But what do you think about the younger lady? Is she Kia or is she Nefertiti? Nefertiti. I have very little. Anyway, assuming that the DNA evidence is real, and there is still people who could question whether the DNA work done in uh, published in 2010 is actually real rather than contamination, because there are people who still argue ancient DNA can't exist, or at least can't exist in mummies. But assuming that's okay, that the the, the, the DNA of that is consistent with her being the a cousin of Akhenaten, which fits in neatly with what, what most sort of reconstructions of the history of the, of, of the royal family seem to work out with. Also, she seems gene, gene, genealogically to be the mother of Tutankhamun, um, and fairly clear, I think, that Akhenaten is his father. Um, all those things come, come together. The, the controversy on that on that really was all to do with with the color they decided to make the skin of the the reconstruction actually that was the big that was the big thing nobody really debated the real issues about why we actually thought she might she was a candidate or not everybody's got got hung up on um whether whether her skin was light enough or dark enough which was like ridiculous yeah. now the thing is that one of the things which are which i which is something i've always been quite sort of vociferous about oh this Kia versus um, Nefertiti business in, in as, as the as the mother of Tutankhamun is that everybody seems, seems to as argue, argues that well Nefertiti is shown with all with these six daughters but never a son therefore she can't be um, his mother but, but Kia is only ever child. shown with one child who's who also a daughter but then if you look at the rules of decorum in in art prior to this we realise that actually no royal prince is ever shown on a temple wall ever yeah. before the Ramesside period. Yeah. Now, the, the, all the knowledge, our knowledge of princes is from the tombs of um, nurses and things like that. So actually to say that, well, she, he can't possibly be the um, son of Nefertiti because he's not shown with her. Well, that, you're looking, you're asking for something which has never existed in Egyptian art. And in fact, if you look at the previous reign, look at the reign of Amenhotep III, at the Temple of Soleb, you've got Amenhotep III there with his wife T, and I think it's three of his daughters are shown on the wall of Temple of Soleb. Yeah. No sign of the two, but we, but we know he had two sons, Thutmose and the future Akhenaten. So they're not they're not there. So are you going to argue therefore T can't be their mother because they're not shown? So a lot of these these sort of I think it's one of these things you've got to be quite careful of with making these kinds of sort of statements is unless you actually have made sure you understand what the, the evidence what the, what the history of the depiction of royal family on temple walls is, you can't assume anything on the basis of what the situation is on one particular one. And that was one of the things which is important, which you know, which came clear to me when I was writing the, the um, Complete Royal Families, mm -hmm. because I had to look at all these things and that became a really, really clear that royal princes do not form part of a royal family group in any kind of temple context, except if they've got a day job. So there's a couple of occasions where you do have royal princes on a temple wall, but that's because they are the high priest of Ptah or the high priest at Memphis. Uh, the high priest uh, to Heliopolis. Those are the only examples before the Ramesside period that you get um, those kinds of representations. Although actually you, the very first representation of a royal prince on a, a temple wall ever may be though the scene which lies behind that the famous block from Hermopolis naming Tutankhaten as a prince yeah. because that clearly comes from a temple wall and that would and that would make Tutankhaten there the first prince ever ever to be on a temple wall mm -hmm. but also which quite significantly there is it's actually from quite late in the reign as well well after all the famous groups of Nefertiti and her daughters so it was an afterthought kind of thing yeah well I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a, it's a change of view I think it's to do, because bear in mind the importance of the royal family in the Aten cult that the, uh, the royal family are the intermediaries between the, the Aten and everybody else. So I think the royal family has suddenly become a more important thing during the, during, uh, during the Amarna period. And that as part of that, 
lay, as the, okay, first of all, you're getting the, 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 the daughters everywhere, not just simply in a couple of locations. They are part of the icon of the royal family. And that, and if you're in a, in a, fair, in a, in a period of great sort of innovation and change like that, um, the idea then to suddenly break that final taboo of actually showing a royal son on a temple wall is then what happens everything in that time yeah and, and, and also and also and then and then therefore once that's been that that sort of final taboo has been broken then when the ramesides really want to sort of big up their their state as a royal family that's then that that leads on to the explosion with you you've got, you've got the 50 50 sons and 50 daughters in, one, in the, the temples of the second and also the and also which is the other the other sort of mold breaker is the depictions of Ramesses as a prince in the gallery of the lists in the yes. um, temple of Abydos. So that sort of, that's how I see the bigger picture. And within that, the idea that the that, you know, Nefertiti is the mother of Tutankhamun, therefore the implications of her therefore being the younger lady, it all sort of it all sort of fits together. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. But it was, it was but one thing which was, which was a sort of pain in that was that actually rather than debating this real stuff, all of it was about should, we, should, the, should the sculptor have made the skin, you know, X, X degrees darker or lighter, which, which rather sort of, that's half the problem though, when you're trying to present something, um, often people, the, the people just get, you know, get, get worked up over what actually is ultimately the trivia on the, on the margins rather than, the, what were they, the real meaty kind of you know arguments you know, and also they, they, we certainly weren't trying to and uh, as like I say in my, when, when I was doing any talking head stuff in that um, the documentary we weren't trying to prove anything it was just interesting to, 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 to have a face produced from that mummy which was not inconsistent with yeah. Nefertiti's representations because again those kinds of representations Although you can probably get, you can get probably the cheekbones and stuff right, but the lips and the nose and stuff are always yeah. to do it a matter of a matter of speculation. And so that, again, I'm saying that I would be quite careful. People should be always very careful about these reconstructions of the this is the re, this is the real face of X, Y, or Z. Yeah. Um, it's not. It's something which probably isn't too far off. But um, no, the, the, be careful with the noses and lips, particularly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But Aidan, I wanted to know what has been the highlight of your career thus far? Highlight of the career? Ooh, that's a difficult one. I suppose there's sort of two levels of it, I suppose. One was actually probably the, 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 the discovery which I was sort of it was most sort of pleased about was, was rediscovering Shoshank the Fourth. Um, was actually publishing the fact that he that he actually was a, a separate a separate figure. It's always been thought that he'd been this had he that this particular king was was actually Shoshank the first with a more with a more elaborate um, name um, name um, set of set of epithets, and it was able to prove that you don't get those epithets that early. So Shoshank the fourth. So therefore, I I rediscovered a pharaoh. Okay, lit only in literary terms, not by sort of digging him up. Yeah, and and the, and the other sort of project was probably when I got a, was appointed to a professor. You know, if you if somebody who starts off as a school a schoolboy enthusiast, um, and then so one day you then suddenly find you get the you get the email through from personnel saying, uh, you know, you you are you are promoted to uh, to professor of Egyptology. Um, it's quite a, it's a it's one of those sort of. It's a big that's, that's, that has to, yeah. has to be that has to be sort of a, a bit of a a, a moment one of the, a moment so i think probably those two one from the point of view of actually doing this you know actually doing something like that and the second as i is actually sort of getting to the point which i think i never think anybody ever i ever believed i could ever possibly be in fact it's one of those odd things that a whole bunch of us of that generation who sort of knew each other as students, myself, Salima, um, a couple of other people, all suddenly finding ourselves as full professors of Egyptology, and we're going, "What happened? You know, where did that come from?" It was a, it's a very good generation of Egyptologists, I have to say. But it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just, you know, you just, it's just odd that you sort of, there's always this sort of imposter, this imposter syndrome, they call it. Yeah. And you don't feel any different from what you did as an enthusiast 
undergraduate, whatever it was, all those all those years ago. And then suddenly you're one of the grown-ups, like you no, know, I when I became chairman of the Egypt Exploration Society, you know, Alan Gardner, Tom, all, all those sort of people have been chairman of the ES in the past. How the hell did I become one? You know, again, it's that sort of it's, it's, it's quite it's quite weird feeling as one moves through a career that you get something. How did that happen? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's happening and it's happening at the right time. And you deserve every bit of that uh, those accomplishments. So, Aidan, before we before we do any questions, I'm gonna do some quick fire questions for you, and then we'll take a few questions from the audience. Are you ready? Indeed, yes. Okay. Favorite place in Egypt. Saqqara. Favourite artefact? Ooh, difficult one. Um, 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 I, to get, uh, I think now, I know what it is. It's the outer coffin of Queen Merita Moon, the colossal one in the Cairo Museum. It's massive, yeah. yeah. Yes, beautifully made, absolutely gorgeously made. Favourite pharaoh? Horemheb. Um, basically because he's a, a guy who sort of basically, basically slaps everybody around and gets things back something like on an even keel. <laughs> Favourite queen? Um, 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 probably Ahotep, um, in the sense that she, again, is somebody, a strong woman, who after the death of her husband, again, seems to sort of rally Egypt. And also, she's the one who gets the, the, the gold flies of valor, which is something, um, you know, um, a woman getting three military decorations suggests she has something about her. Yeah, yeah. Favorite place apart from Egypt? I have to confess, I'm very, I'm very fond of where I live now, Bristol. <laughs> um, I, I very much fall in love with the place. I was a broad, I was a, I was a, I'm a born and bred Londoner, came down here 25 odd years ago. Um, no, I, I think, I think I really, I just, I, I'm very happy here. Yeah, yeah. A discovery you want to see made still? I would like to see the complete clearance down to bedrock of the central area of the Valley of the Kings because I suspect there may still be one more tomb there which might contain the missing Amman princesses. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Aidan. That was so much fun getting to know you, hearing about your stories. I would like to now open up to some of the audience members. So whoever has their question, please unmute and ask your question. I have a question. Yeah. Hi, Marissa. Hi, Aiden. Hey, credit to everybody. Um, I'm Marissa from New York City. Um, and Aiden, I'm one of the people you spoke about earlier who's been joining the Egypt, Egypt the EES um, lectures that we never would have. You know, I live in New York. So thank you. I'm one of the people you talked about with this amazing Zoom boom. Um, when you were talking about how there aren't, um, the royal princes aren't ever portrayed before the Ramesses period. What is, why? What is your theory? Is this, I, think yeah, I have some ideas, but. Yeah, I think it's all, I think if you look at it actually that the, this, the depiction of anybody other than the Pharaoh is quite a, a rare thing. And you, you, you start getting queens starting to be shown occasionally during the Middle Kingdom um, and the New Kingdom. But I think it's all to do with a, a, an increasing decentralization almost of kingship. The initiatives that for mo for the first sort of millennium or more, it's the the king is all that matters. Everybody that that the, the royal family are just something which is necessary to perpetuate the the race. So, that, that, you know, so you get another. So there's another. There's the only important point about the queen is that she is the mother of the next king. The only important about the crown prince is he's going to be the next king. That then what I think we're, we're seeing is a gradual erosion of that very sort of strict. Um, situation 
Quite why it happens is very difficult to tell. One wonders that particularly during, it may be because in the early 18th dynasty, you have this position, this, this Ahotep apparently being sort of almost the savior of the state after Second Enre gets killed in battle. Um, also, Ahmo's Nefertiri is particularly important. So I think you've got a couple of very strong women in the royal family at the beginning of the 18th dynasty. And that then allows later strong women and to some degree also strong younger women, their daughters, to start appearing. Because it's interesting, you don't find it consistently in every reign. Amenhotep II, you've got no trace of his wife whatsoever, or even daughters on the monuments. Then you get, under Amenhotep um, II, of course, Queen T, her daughters. All. So I think, well, it's, 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 there's something about what's going on at the beginning of the 18th dynasty, and then that leaves a space for later royal women to imitate, if you like. So, you know, with, with, with the examples of Ahotep, Ahmed's Nefertiri, and Hatshepsut all before them, therefore it means that people like T and so on really have got a model to move. For. And once, and again, once you've, again, once you've broken, the broken a taboo, break it, just moving a little bit further into that taboo isn't so difficult as that first thing. And so therefore, the moment that Akhenaten, as I believe, broke the taboo of having a royal son on a wall, then it was possible for the Ramessides to use that. And probably because they wanted to actually emphasize they were a new royal line. Particularly also when you've got, at the end of the 80s, you've got three generals coming to the throne in, or, in, in order. They want to then show that there is now a, prop, a proper uh, a proper sort of line of succession going off, which Seti does by putting Ramesses on the wall with, of, the, of his temple at Abydos, but then, uh, uh, then Ramesses II, as in most things, goes completely over the top by putting every single child on his temple walls. And I think that is then, say, what probably starts the rot, which allows rebellious princes later in the, you know, in the, in the sense of Amon Messes. Then of course you get Ramesses III is murdered to try and get one of his younger sons to, over, to come in rather than the actual crown prince. So that's the sort of picture I, sort of, I see. Thank you, thank you so much. Next question. Anybody, I see Jill, I see you're unmuted. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking about this uh, novel you're writing, Aidan. Well, I, I tried to write, I, I, it hasn't been, I've not done anything on it for about 25 years. It was one of those things. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I, sort of start, I started it um, and never got, got beyond that point. Um, because I also I discovered really that, that, that the thing is that, the, that writing fiction is a very different skill from writing nonfiction. And I'm not necessarily, I wasn't necessarily sure I can sort of write, you know, convincing dialogue and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it would be something I would, and there was also another, another sort of vague, start, vaguely started novel from, again, that kind of period, 25, 30 odd years ago, which was sort of a semi-comic novel about um, uh, the life of an, of a, an archaeology department at the university, sort of vaguely autobiographical in the sense of cl clamming together various personalities and events from the well, the four universe, five universes I've now been involved with over the years, but again, that never really got any. The first chapter, in fact, the first chapter got written, and the second chapter got lost um, when in a computer crash. Having spent, I've never. It's to say, it's sitting there on my hard drive, both of them, which I don't think will ever, will ever go anywhere. But um, but on the other hand, sort of one thing which, which in the plotting of the late 19th Dynasty one was concerned, it was quite useful in trying to get my head around what might have happened, even though, you know, rather, even though I'm, you know, you would, I'm not actually going to put that kind of stuff in the, in the proper thing. Well, I think it would be very interesting. Yeah, it's, 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 the problem, it's, 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 simply, it's probably it's simply time to do these things. Uh, yes. But um, you know, it's only so many hours in the day, and I, and I do like to try and not sort of spend the entire day sort of hunched over a hunched over a laptop. It's not good for you. Exactly. Um, and and also, there's certain things where I, if I'm doing stuff which I think actually makes a difference in the sense of you know new study of something or whatever, versus some versus sort of a more you know effectively a pot boiler, I suppose. And again, I'm just 
I was not convinced if I did spend, you know, six months writing this novel, actually it would be any, it would be any good. You know, it might, the, 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 the content might be okay as far as, you know, a credible story, but actually whether it would be any, whether it would actually, you know, I'm, I'm no Terry Pratchett, shall we say, when it comes to write as, a, as an author. I'm a completely different sort of author. Well, I would buy a copy. 19th Dynasty is like for me. So. Mm. <laughs> Never know one day. One day I might say this. I know everybody's got at least one novel in them, so I might actually finally do it. But yeah. we'll see. I, I must admit, your, your, your choice of Horanhem is a fascinating character. Um, his progress and what happened when he's alive, it must have been an uh, incredible life. And I, I do like his, in the British Museum, it's a wonderful statue of him with his, his partner there. And the way they're holding hands, I think every time I go there, it's the first thing I go and look, look at, because I think it's, uh, yeah. there's so much there. And I've heard very little in all the lectures I've heard about him. I've heard many learned lectures about many pharaohs, but never horror him. The trouble is we don't really know much about him. That's the problem. You know, he, this is the trouble that, you know, we, we, he sort of, we don't know anything about his family background particularly. Uh, we know he, you know, he arrives. So there's sort of very little one you've, you know, I've, I've produced a, you know, I've produced this chapter on him in um, Mana Sunset, but that was, and I had actually thought about possibly trying to do a book on him in this, in this Lives and Afterlives series I'm doing for AUC Press. But actually, there's not enough meat, if you like, to be able to to get there. Uh, it's for fiction, for yeah. uh, putting your own dialogue in there. Yeah, and the thing is, I think it's also possibly my sort of like the reason I'm quite keen on it because I come from a military family. There's something about sort of the the, the bluff soldier as the um, person who has to come and sort out the um, everybody else's everybody else's mess. Um, so yeah, it is. It's and all, but also though, he's. You know, I like I, the the art of his reign is nice. Is nice. It's a nice sort of um, halfway house between sort of the Amarna and then sort of getting to the rather less, rather more stereotypical stuff during the Ramesside period. So it's it's an it's an it's, it's it's interesting in all kinds of levels. It's just one wishes there was a little bit more data one could one could be able to throw in at it. There's you know there's still 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 the question about whether he reigned for fifteen years or thirty years, and that makes a big difference to what you say about him if you've got a relatively short reign versus um, this more chunky one so yeah but uh, yes he's a, he, one would like to see a bit know, know a bit more about him he's a, he's one of the things I would, people I would, would love to find you know his long lost autobiography in some um, papyrus roll somewhere but I have a fear that the Egyptians don't write and never wrote that sort of biography any autobiography anyway so um, however yeah but no that's yes he, he's he is that's the trouble. There's just not quite enough about him to be able to be able to. Maybe he did not give enough money to the temples to yeah. warrant anybody writing about him. Yeah. Well, Derek and Aidan, you can always ask. We have Vanessa Foot online here, and she is in Egypt. She is indeed. <laughs> yeah. Although, although, although they had the hassle of having to get COVID <laughs> tests and all that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> she could go looking for information about Horam Hib for us. Do, do you want me to go have a dig around? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you've got your work cut out with the South Assasif, so... Uh, yeah, qu quite busy, I have to say. There's a, a, an awful lot of work to do in the last few weeks of the season, so... <laughs> quite. But at least you're at, least, at least you're actually in the South Assasif for a decent time of year, rather than the usual South Assasif digging time of the summer. So, oh, tell that, me about it. <laughs> so I think I think you're probably in a much better better position uh, from that point of view than you would. Uh, the last otherwise. few days, I, I've considered myself very lucky because my office is an excavator's tent um, with a view up to the monast the, the temple at Deir El Medina. Uh, Deir El Medina. Yes. So I've been sitting there typing up excavation reports with this beautiful view. It's just been awesome. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. it's yes. Ter a terrible, terrible thing to have to do. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's awful. I have to say, it's dreadful. <laughs> yes. Yes. Can you can you show us your view with your camera, or is it it's nighttime? I'm, I'm not there now. It's it's nighttime oh. here. So yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm waiting to go to bed because it's uh, my bus comes at quarter to six in the morning to so take me to work. Oh. <laughs> 
And speaking <laughs> of Horem Heb, my, my favorite, one of my favorite works at the Metropolitan Museum of Art where I give tours is Horem Heb as Scribe, mm -hmm. which yes. is, uh, and I use it all the time when I teach um, about hieroglyphs and, and scribes. So, yeah. And, 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 for him too. and, his, and his tomb is gorgeous. Both his tomb, both his, both his private tomb at Saqqara and the um, one in the Valley of the Kings are also gorgeous things as well. So, uh, it, 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 his, reign ticks, his reign sort of ticks a whole load of, a load of boxes, both sort of politically, aesthetically, and everything else. Um, yes, we would just, just love to know his, who, his, who his parents were. Yeah. Um, I would like to say you're the first uh, serious Egyptologist whom I hear saying that Horem has, Horemheb is your favorite uh, uh, pharaoh. Mine too, I have a soft spot for him. Now I hear uh, Marissa too is talking about him, but otherwise everybody just kind of sloughs him off and yeah. <laughs> so I'm happy. <laughs> the Horn Head fan club, look, we're all meeting each other <laughs> across the world. Who knew we all existed? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> all right. Well, if I think if anybody else has got, we'll take one more question. If not, then I think we shall call that a wrap. Oh, thank you very much for the bit I got of it. I've, I've so enjoyed it because there's all these little bits which you don't get in normal lectures. These mm. tiny little asides which are, yeah. uh, explain, especially like those uh, uh, sort of the illustrations of the, the females on tombs, but not the males, unless they are a, uh, a priest, which is things that you don't get told, you know, if you just find them out accidentally. Mm. Yeah. No, I don't, I'd like to, I, mean, I, mean, I think these, these sort of chats are really, are really interesting. Um, and I, think, I think it's nice to have an opportunity just to talk about, uh, there's, there's been really a couple of other things where I think I was doing, I've been, had this sort of opportunity as well, just to, rather than being giving, giving a formal lecture, just to chat about you know, how I see things and why I do things and so on. So I think this is a, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a really, it's a really nice format. Yeah, yeah. And thank you for thank taking you. the time again. to talk to us. Thank you. Yeah. Um, John Hill in Australia sent a text message with a question. He wanted to know, have you ever been to the mountain of Anubis in the oasis? Uh, which is the mountain? Well, I'm not sure which, is, which actually is the mountain of Anubis in the oasis. It's, um, I've, been, I've, been to all, I've been to all the oases, but I'm not sure what counts as the mountain of Anubis. Because the, the only mountain of Anubis which I'm aware of is the one at Abydos, which is the um, which is the, which is the hill into which the tomb of Sinwasra III is um, is cut. So I'm not it quite sure. That one it might be that one that he's referring to. Yeah, in which case I've seen it at the bottom of it. Yes, um, but say so I've, I've been to all the in the all the oasis. I'm not sure what you would call the Mount of Anubis out there. Okay, okay, um, and I also see he's asked something about uh, Pharaoh Senebke. Yes. What oh, yes. Pictures of him. Yeah. So, but what was the question again? Sorry about what him. You, what are you, What are your impressions about him? Well, well, actually, this is actually his is one of those re, those really interesting discoveries, which really sort of re, re um, write quite a few things. For those of you who don't know, um, his tomb was found a couple of years ago by the Penn team at Abydos, and his body was found in in his tomb there. Um, and there was a couple of things about him. One is that he had been killed in battle. There was enough injuries on his skeleton to show that. But the other thing was that when they analysed his his um, his skeleton, um, it was worked out he had he'd ridden horses because if you're if you're a, if you're an equestrian, it leads to skeletal changes because of the, the muscles and stuff you use. And the, he's he's late second intermediate period, and so suddenly shows that. Egyptian pharaohs, or at least he's, he's, a, he's a fairly minor, he's, he's a, one of the native pharaohs fighting against the Hyksos, um, he fought, they, actually, they actually ride horses in battle, not as all depictions have of them in chariots. So is the fact that he is riding a horse here something unique? Is this something very unusual? How does the fact that you've got this king riding, riding a horse in the late second intermediate period fit with all later pharaohs who we see um, being sort of moved by horses are in chariots. So it, it, it raises some whole some very interesting questions about the investigation of the horse in Egypt and its use. So um, 
it's, it's, a, it's one of these starting points, I think, for, for further research, has yeah. to be. Yeah. But yeah, yes. But again, that's one of those things. So it was suddenly a bit of information coming out of the blue. Um, that, that was only, what, three or four years ago, I think, that was found. Yeah. Although, I must say, as, as one gets older, one tends to think of, th of discoveries as being a couple of years ago. Then you discover, actually, it was 15 years ago. Um, <laughs> We recently had, we, we, we moved house, we had a, a new kitchen put in. We had, we had it put in by the same contracts who'd done, done the um, kitchen in our old, in our old um, flat. And then I went in and said, basically want as far as possible a, a, another version of that kitchen. And he said, well, when did we do this for you? I said, well, seven or eight years ago, 15 years ago, when he finally found the file in the, in the, in the, in the depths of his, 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 um, his storeroom. So yeah. Recent, relatively recent past, shall we say. Yeah, yeah. Well, Aidan, thank you so, so much. That was so fascinating, so interesting to hear your thoughts and your opinions on things. Um, always great to pick your brain. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk to myself and to answer questions from our audience. Very happy to have done so. Thank right. you. And thank you to, to John, Jay Johnson for uh, putting us all in touch. <laughs> Indeed. Well, so it's a fairly small world of Egyptology, I have to say. It is, it is indeed. Yeah. Right. Anyway, thank you so much, everybody. And um, tune in. Uh, I have a few more interviews coming up soon. Um, Bethany Hughes, I will be chatting to her on the 17th of December. Um, and a few others, so stay tuned. Righty ho, look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Aiden. Thanks, okay. everyone. Have a good evening. Bye, everyone. Thank you again, Curtis. Thank you, uh, Aiden. Thanks, Marissa. Ciao. Thanks, Curtis. See you on Monday, Aiden. Monday evening. Inshallah. <laughs>